630. If uh, Nellie, if you could do a roll call, that would be great. Thank you. When I call your jurisdiction, if you will please state your name. San Mateo County. Dave Pine. You, San Mateo County. Atherton. Rick DeGolia. Belmont. Julia Mates. Brisbane. Colleen Mackin. Burlingame. Donna Colson. Colma. Daly City. Rodas Magbua. East Palo Alto. Foster City. Half Moon Bay. Harvey Rarback. Hillsboro. Larry May. Los Banos. Dom Faria. Menlo Park. Betsy Nash. Milbray. Anders Funk. Pacifica. Tiger Jazz Big Stick. Portola Valley. Jeff Alfs. Redwood City. Giselle Hale. San Bruno. Marty Medina. San Carlos. Laura Palmer Lohan. San Mateo. Rick Bonilla. South San Francisco. Woodside. Director Emeritus. Ben Wall for Woodside. Thank you. Director Emeritus. Pradeep Gupta. Yeah, and Director Emeritus. Uh, John Keener. Thank you. And we have a quorum. Thank you. Great. Welcome, everybody. Uh, let, let me see if there is any public comment on a matter that is not on the agenda. I don't see any public comment. If anyone has public comments, you can click on the reactions button, button at the bottom of your screen and raise your hand. Uh, I, I don't see any at, at this time. We'll ask for public comment as we go through each item. Uh, before I ask for a motion to set the agenda and approve the consent items, uh, everybody should have gotten an email today from Jan uh, requesting that we add a special item to the agenda, which we're able to do with a two thirds vote. And uh, I will ask Jan to describe that item. And then if uh, that, and then we'll take a vote to see if you would like to add it to the agenda. And if so, we'll add it to the consent calendar. Although I will make sure that uh, we allow anyone to comment on it that wishes to comment, including public comment. Great, thank you, Rick. Um, and actually, I think the, the email came from Nelly, our board oh, okay. with the, with the uh, proposed new agenda item. So we are asking that the board of directors add an additional item tonight to the consent agenda, which has come up in the last day in which we were unable to include in the agenda when it was originally published. And this is to rescind the resolution that was approved by this board on December 16th, 2021, regarding the um, interim CFO and treasurer. And by rescinding that resolution, the effect would be that Andy Stern will continue as um, Peninsula Clean Energy's CFO and treasurer. And, and, and just to clarify, it, Andy isn't coming back to be the long-term CFO. We're launching the search for a CFO or director of finance, but Andy understands the system so well, it makes more sense for him to act in that capacity that he had acted in. And we don't need Eric, but the board had approved Eric uh, to fill into those roles. So this is reversing that decision, allowing now Andy to refill those roles. Yeah, and, and we've just kind of accelerated our timeline, which is why we, we thought that it was going to be like six months before we got around to hiring a new CFO or director of finance. And um, we believe it's going to happen within the next month or two. So it makes more sense to just continue with the continuity we have right now, Andy. And he has graciously offered to continue to work with us since. Uh, and, and, and in order to make this a uh, special change uh, due to um, this, this change that occurred subsequent to publishing the agenda for this meeting, we need to get two thirds vote. And uh, Jennifer, if you have anything to add, 
uh, from a legal perspective, please feel free to chime in. Yes, I think that um, you have it correct. We do need the two thirds vote to actually add the agenda item. And then um, my understanding is that it will go to on consent. Okay, great. So, so, so the first item, if I could get an motion to include this item, I'd appreciate it. Make a motion what? to add this item to the consent agenda. Second. Okay, uh, so I have a motion from Rick Bonilla and a second from Laura Palmer Lohan. Could we do a roll call on this item, please? Uh, just to, before we vote, just to clarify, are, we, are yeah. we voting to add this to the agenda and then subsequently voting to approve the consent agenda? Or are we approving the consent agenda as amended with this, this item? No, we're, we're first voting to add this to the consent agenda. We need to do that separately. And okay. then I'll, I'll take a motion. Then to we set action. Add this, but but I, I want to give if anyone on the board wants. We have a motion in a second, so we're going to vote on this. But before we go to roll call, if anyone uh, has any questions or any comments about this, I, I, I'd like to entertain them. I, I don't see any questions or comments, and if there's any public comment on this matter. Uh, now would be a good time to uh, bring that public comment forward. Okay, I, I don't see any public comment and I don't see any comments or indications of questions from members of the board. Uh, so Nellie, if we can do a roll call, that would be great. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, San Mateo County. Yes. San Mateo County. Atherton. Yes. Belmont. Yes. Brisbane. Yes. Burlingame. Yes. Colma. Daly City. Yes. East Palo Alto. Foster City. Half Moon Bay. Yes. Hillsborough. Yes. Los Banos. Yes. Menlo Park. Yes. Millbrae. Yes. Pacifica. Yes. Portola Valley. Yes. Redwood City. Yes. San Bruno. Yes. San Carlos. Yes. San Mateo. Yes. South San Francisco. Yes. And Woodside. Yes. The motion passes. Great. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, if, if we had known this when the agenda was published, we obviously would have included it in the agenda, but it just came up this week. Uh, <clears throat> so I would uh, like to entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar and set the agenda. Move to approve the consent calendar and set the agenda. Mates. Second. Uh, okay, I got a motion from Bates and a second. Was it from Hale? I'm not sure. Yes. Mates, Mates and Hale, yes. Great. Uh, I, just let, let me see. It, we, we have approved to add this special item to the consent calendar, but I do want to give one more opportunity if anyone has any comment, either on the board or public comment uh, on the matter. And if anyone would like to pull anything from the consent calendar, this would be an appropriate time to indicate that. Okay, uh, I don't see anyone with a hand raised, so I uh, don't see any public comment or comment from member of the board. If we could do a roll call on setting the agenda and approving the consent calendar, that would be great. Thank you. San Mateo County? Yes. San Mateo County? Atherton? Yes. Belmont? Yes. Brisbane? Yes. Berlin game? Yes. Colma? Daly City? Yes. East Palo Alto? Yes. Foster City? Half Moon Bay? Yes. Hillsboro? Yes. Los Banos? Yes. Benlo Park? Yes. 
Millbury? Yes. Pacifica? Yes. Portola Valley? Yes. Redwood City? Yes. San Bruno? Yes. San Carlos? Yes. San Mateo? Yes. South San Francisco? Yes. And Woodside? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so we're now going to move to the regular agenda. I do not have a chair report. Um, we need to, uh, but I, 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 the next item on the agenda is the appointment of a uh, nominating committee for the uh, chair and vice chair for the next year. And that nominating committee, uh, which I, we as a board need to approve, I am recommending that that be Julia Mates as the chair of the committee with Jeff Alps and Laura Palmer Lohan as the members. It'll be a three member committee. Uh, and uh, so our first step is to approve that committee. If I can get a motion to approve that, I would appreciate it. I make a I'm motion to approve that committee. Okay, I'm not sure if that came from Carlos or Rick. I'll Carlos. second Rick. <laughs> okay, yes. That's, that's Rick and Carlos seconding it. Uh, if there's any public comment on this or if anyone on the board has a comment, uh, now would be a good time to bring that up. Okay, if we could do a roll call. Hey, San Mateo County. Yes. San Mateo County. Atherton. Yes. Belmont. Thank you for the nomination and yes. Brisbane. Yes. Burlingame. Yes. Colma. Daly City. Yes. East Palo Alto. Yes. Foster City. Half Moon Bay. Yes. Hillsboro. Yes. Los Banos. Yes. Menlo Park. Yes. Millbrae. Yes. Pacifica. Yes. Portola Valley. Yes. Redwood City. Yes. San Bruno. Yes. San Carlos. Yes, and thank you. San Mateo. Sorry, yes. Thank you. South San Francisco. Yes. And Woodside. Woodside? Yes. Thank you. The motion passes. Okay, great. Now, uh, before we move off this item, I just want to request that anyone who is a member of the board that would like to uh, nominate yourself or someone else to be uh, either the chair or the vice chair for the next year, please contact uh, one of the three members of this committee. Uh, and uh, then they will uh, consider that and they will make a recommendation at the next board meeting. Um, the next item on the agenda is appointment of an ad hoc citizens advisory committee nominating committee. Uh, I'm not sure who is introducing this item. Uh, I can. Hi, this is Kirsten. And okay, uh, uh, one, yeah, hi. Um, you know, once again, we'd like to ask a couple of our board members to step up and um, and volunteer to help us select some uh, new members of our Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, it's not that big a commitment. Um, there's a couple of meetings and some emails involved. And um, so it's, uh, one of the meetings will be quite long because uh, we'll be interviewing uh, the uh, candidates. Um, staff handles the application process um, and we'll get you some uh, good applicants to uh, interview and select and to uh, recommend a nomination uh, for approval to the full board. And that process um, will start just, you know, some emails now and um, the actual interviews will probably happen in about April. Okay. Are there any members of the board that would volunteer uh, to be 
a nominating committee for the Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, I see Donna has her hand raised. Thank you, Donna. And Marty, great, thank you. And it would be great if we could get one more person. Three people would be a terrific committee. Um, Rick, could, um, could this be something that if someone's here tonight and they're the, um, they're the, you know, not the primary lead, but they're the secondary lead, they could still raise their hand to be involved in this? Uh, yeah, I've, I've got both Rick Benia and Jeff out. So I think we've got a good committee okay, there. Great. Great. Okay, thank you all. Uh, and I, I, Jennifer, is it accurate? Do we need, is this, this is an action item? Nellie, is this an action item? I'm not, I'm not clear from the agenda if it is or not. I don't believe this is an action item. No, I don't believe we need to vote on this. So we can so, move on. So we're, we're going to constitute those four members of the board to be the ad hoc citizens advisory committee nominating committee. Great. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the CEO report. Thank you. Uh, nice to see all of you here tonight and thank you for coming. Um, so if we can go to the first uh, slide. So I just wanted to, to note that the search firm that we're working with, John Furnaborg, has identified several strong COO candidates and we're in the process of meeting with them and uh, hoping that we actually may be able to land on someone fairly soon in the next month or so. Um, the, and then we have also retained John Furneborg for our CFO director of finance search. And as you just uh, asked a couple minutes ago, Andy Stern will continue as the CFO until the search is completed. So thank you for that. Um, next slide, please. So some other updates. Um, I talked to you last month about the uh, PG&E rate changes and the PUC issued a proposed decision on Monday in the ERA case, uh, E-R-R-A case, uh, which is where they set the rates for PG&E in terms of their generation rates and the PCIA rates. And so the, the final decision we expect to be made at the February 10th PUC commission meeting. And then if it is made then, then PG&E has 15 days to publish their new rates. Uh, so that would be towards the end of February. Um, and, they will, and then those new rates would become effective on March 1. So next month in, uh, at our February board me meeting, we will be asking for your authorization to adjust rates based on what that commission decision ends up being and based on what PG&E publishes. But what we expect, the changes that we expect to occur based on what PG&E filed is that PG&E generation rates will increase by 33% or 3.6 cents per kilowatt hour starting March 1st. And the PCIA rate for San Mateo County customers will decrease by 57% or by 2.6 cents starting March 1st. So that's a total of a 6.2 cent increase in what we call the headroom, which is the, the, the amount of, of room we have between our rate and the, the PG&E rate. So um, that will be a good thing for us to, um, to be again operating in the black. Uh, on the, for Los Banos, same thing as far as the PG&E generation rates, because those rates increase um, system-wide for all PG&E customers. And this is the 33% increase on a system average rate. Each individual tariff may be slightly different than that, but overall, uh, again, we expect the PG&E generation rates will increase by 33%. Um, on March 1st, 
that will occur before we start serving customers in Los Banos. We will start serving customers in Los Banos on, in starting in April. Therefore, those rates will have already taken effect. And then once we enroll customers in Los Banos in April, they will see their rates go down because of our 5% discount on generation rates. So that will be a good thing for Los Banos customers. And we're gonna try to make sure that we uh, clearly communicate that because rates are, are complicated to explain. The, uh, the PCIA rate, for Los Banos customers, they're a different vintage because they're, they're being enrolled in a CCA at a different time, uh, will decrease by 8%. So the PCIA rate will be different for Los Banos than for San Mateo County because they're different vintages. But when you add together the R rate plus the PCIA and the franchise fee surcharge, uh, it will be the same total rate which will be 5% less than PG&E's generation rate. We'll go over all this in excruciating detail with you in February. Some of you know this really well because we've been doing this for a number of years now. Um, but for those of you where it's more something more new, we will um, we'll go through that with you in February. Um, so I'll pause there in case there are any questions about that. It looks like Jeff has a question. Yeah, Jeff has a question. Yeah, that, I mean, PG&E's rate increase and that PCIA decrease, I mean, that's that sounds like a substantial windfall for us. Is that, is that um, have you have you guys, I mean, I assume you have been looking at the model, the financial model and seeing how much extra money is, is it sounds like, I mean, it seems like a huge change in terms of uh, free cash flow. Is that correct? Uh, yes, it will be positive for us. Um, as you may recall, we are projecting a loss for this year because the PCIA last year was so large and the PG&E rates were low, um, but wholesale prices in the market were high. So we were projecting, I think, an $18 million loss for this fiscal year. So by this, through this rate change, uh, which will take effect for our customers on April 1st, we'll have three months in this fiscal year to be uh, collecting a, a larger sum and um, that will help reduce that loss, although we still may have a loss. And just to, just to note for um, San Mateo County customers, so the PG&E generation rate is going up 3.6 cents, but the PCIA is going down 2.6 cents. So the net increase for San Mateo County customers overall will be one cent per kilowatt hour higher in their rates. Um, that's not taking into account our, our discounts. So overall, the, the impact on customer bills shouldn't be, um, well, anyway, I don't wanna, I don't get too, too mixed up in this, but um, hopefully the impact on customer bills will not be that horrible but we'll get into that in excruciating detail in February and get numbers and charts out there to explain how all of this is happening. But yes, it is positive for us. Uh, okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, I'll keep going then. So if we can go to the next slide. So, um, this is the load impact analysis since COVID-19. We thought we'd be done with this, but you know, COVID keeps hanging on. So here we are almost two, two years into this. So the next slide, please. Um, so this first graph looking at monthly load <coughs> shows the change in load on a monthly basis from January, 2020 through December, 2021. Overall, there was a 3% decrease in PCE's load in 2020 um, in 2021 20, compared to 2020. And when we look monthly, there was a 5% decrease from January to March. Um, there was, the load was about the same from April to July. And then there was about a 4% decrease from August to December. So um, we're seeing generally less, uh, less usage uh, over time. The next slide, please, um, shows the 
monthly load changes by customer class. And so this, so a, a red means that that customer class uh, load has, is decreasing compared to the same month in the previous year. And this shows that resident, commercial and residential loads were significantly lower uh, from August to December compared to 2020. And that's mainly due to the heat waves that we had in 2020, uh, the amount of, so there was a lot of extra power used during that time and we didn't experience those heat waves in 2021. And then we go to the last graph, which is our load shape. And this shows for the 24 hours of a day in these four months, September, October, November, December, the gray line is 2021, the orange line is 2020, and the blue line is 2019. And we can see uh, for all of these months that the load, um, well, certainly in September, the 2021 load was lower during the, uh, the majority of the day in the evening, same in October and November. And then in December, it was very similar to the 2019 and 2020 load. Um, so we're not seeing an increase in load and, and it appears that um, the in, that there isn't, there isn't as high a load for commercial and industrial because maybe because people are not back in the office or some people are not, but the residential load, which, which increased a lot initially has come back down. So overall our load is lower than it was in the past. And uh, thank you to the power resources team, particularly Medi, who puts these, uh, does all this, this analysis and put these, puts these graphs together. Uh, the next slide is on our reach codes. So this shows what the status is. So we have 12 jurisdictions in San Mateo County that have adopted some form of reach code. Uh, Half Moon Bay had scheduled their second reading and uh, but this was delayed in order for staff to do more work on it and that's expected to come back to their council in February and Portola Valley is in the process of scheduling their first reading to look at the reach codes and uh, we'll be starting our rounds for the 2022 reach codes updates with all of you soon. And then last slide is just showing when our next meetings are uh, Citizens Advisory Committee on February 10th. In February, we have both the Audit and Finance Committee and the Executive Committee meeting on Valentine's Day. And on the 24th, we'll have the board meeting and we will be jumping into rates as well as a number of other items at that meeting. So happy to answer any questions that any of you might have. Uh, if anyone has a question, if you can, shake your hand at me or you can click on reactions and if there's any public comment on this you can raise your hand by clicking on reactions i don't see any so let's move on to the next item which is the citizens advisory committee report i assume morgan is going to provide that yes i am thank you Rick. uh hi everyone happy thursday uh, we're striving to align the CAC efforts to support the PCE strategic goals for 2022. And in our last meeting, we heard from Jan and Raphael about those goals. Um, first, delivering renewable energy 24 seven by 2025, contributing to San Mateo County's goal of being 100% greenhouse gas free by 2045, and the important focus on electrification programs. And specifically, I think the CAC can support the goal of local power generation within San Mateo County, as well as supporting efforts around reach codes and EV charging. Um, there's also a great amount of interest on the CAC uh, in determining financial models to drive electrification and decarbonization. And there's coordination between staff and the CAC to potentially conduct a study and or produce a white paper on what it takes to get funding. Um, there's also continued emphasis on the importance of getting local contractors trained on the implementation piece. And then I just wanted to call out as recruitment for new CAC members starts, um, I would encourage the ad hoc committee to consider and prioritize equity and representation and assess gaps on our current CAC roster. Uh, happy to work with you on that. 
um, uh, mostly because two of our CAC members who were real champions of the DEI work, Ray and Terry, have moved and had to rotate off the CAC. And we think this is a critical area for the CAC to stay engaged with. Um, and we'll be finalizing our 2022 CAC work plan and sharing that after we finalize it in our next meeting. Okay. That's it for me. Thank you, Morgan. Does, does anybody have a question for Morgan? Or any comment from any member of the board? Or any public comment on the CAC report? Okay, I don't see any. We will move on. Uh, the next item on the agenda, agenda is approval of the 2022 policy platform. And Mark will be making the presentation. Yes, thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair DeGolia and members of the board. Uh, we have for your consideration and adoption Peninsula Clean Energy's 2022 policy platform. Uh, each year, staff reviews legislation at the state. Uh oh, you're muted, Mark. There you go. So uh, each year, uh, staff reviews legislation at the state level and regulatory matters at the California Public Utilities Commission and other state agencies. Uh, to identify opportunities that further Peninsula Clean Energy's mission and strategic plan priorities. We also examine uh, legislative efforts that might limit our mission or impede our organization's opportunities. And while we consider matters on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, the annual board approved policy platform provides a publicly accessible, transparent, and proactive summary of policies and priorities uh, to guide activities for the coming year. Uh, the proposed policy positions before you this evening incorporate recent input from staff in all departments of Peninsula Clean Energy, as well as contributions from the members of the board's legislative committee. Uh, please note that for 2022, we have changed the terminology and are calling this document the policy platform rather than the legislative platform. We believe that this more accurate, accurately reflects the work of Peninsula Clean Energy and what we do uh, and how we're engaged on policy matters in the legislative and regulatory spaces. Uh, please find in your packet the proposed policy platform and that includes a red line version that distinguishes changes from the 2021 platform. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Uh, are Rick Benia has a question. Well, if there are no questions, I have some comments I'd like to make. Great, that'd be good. Okay, good. So I looked at these uh, uh, changes very carefully. And I wanna say, I think that in general, these updates uh, look good. I do have a couple of uh, things that I think we could do a little better on uh, under uh, what's shown there as item number seven, uh, local economic development. In fact, there's some language that I would like to add because we make a couple of statements there and I think we need to make sure that we cover <clears throat> the other end of that same issue with some affirm affirmative statements. So for instance, uh, item B there, which says, and could we show what item B says there in the report <clears throat> for the board's edification, please. It's Roman numeral, numeral seven in item B. <clears throat> One moment, Rick, I'm getting that pulled up. Sure, thank you, Nelly. In fact, I wanna start with item A, actually. Okay, so if you look at Roman numeral seven, item A there, can you make it a little bit bigger, Nelly? It's kind of small. That's better. Right. Just scroll up a little. You need to scroll up. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. So item A says support policies that are consistent with Peninsula Clean Energy's commitment to a sustainable workforce. Well, I think when you're stating policies, you need to be very clear. Uh, there is another end to that same uh, 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 sentiment actually, which is that we should oppose policies that are not consistent with Peninsula Clean Energy's commitment to a sustainable workforce. So that's my first uh, proposed change. And then following, immediately following what I just suggested, I would add new item C, which is that we would assert, wait a minute, I think I might have left something out there. Well, let me see where we are. It says support efforts to enhance development of look, I'm, I'm sorry. Let me go grab my notes for once. Oh, here they are right here. Okay, good. So after B, then the next uh, uh, C would be C, which says assert PG&E's inclusive and sustainable workforce policy wherever no such policy is present. And that's because we've, we've learned now that there is a world where there are entities which wish uh, uh, to have no policies. And uh, I think that we have stated our position on uh, economic development and workforce. Um, and I think we should uh, assert that where there is a, a vacancy or an absence of any delineated thought around it. So those are my suggestions. I put that out there for discussion. Um, I think they're uh, not really controversial, but I, I would invite anybody to a comment. If that's appropriate, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think that's fine, but let's clarify exactly what the proposal is. Well, actually, I sent an email with all this language on it earlier to Jan and Nellie. And so if they might be able to show that, we could see exactly what the language is. Uh, Donna, oh, you're muted. Well, while you're pulling that up for Rick, um, on item C, same, same, same area there, we list out all the different kinds of renewable energy. And I'm wondering if we might, because we don't know how technology is going to change in the future. And so for now, is it, would it be amenable to say, including but not limited to, and then list? And the other reason I bring that back up again is because I know we've sort of, you know, closed the door on even something like renewable, like nuclear, but, you know, that may come back in and be a conversation down the door. I'm not saying we have to list it here, but I'm just wondering if we want to at least give ourselves a room because right there we've been very specific and if something came outside of the realm of that i'm not sure how it would fit in okay <clears throat> well let we we can't see two things at the yeah, same yeah just finish rick's off because it's so the let's same deal one. with the comment from rick and then we'll uh come back to this one So it's not clear to me from looking at this exactly what is suggested, Rick. Well, we have a right there. Okay, if we go down on my page, I see it there. Um, new item B, which follows the existing item A, right? Item A says support policies that are consistent with PCE's commitment to sustainable workforce. But then I would add a new item B, right after that A, which is shown there. Uh, where is it? Item B again? There. Oppose policies that are not consistent with Peninsula Clean Energy's commitment to a sustainable workforce. Could you put your, um, your uh, little thing right next to it, the new item B there, please? That's where it shows that language. Okay, so we said we support our language, but uh, uh, policies that contain our language, but I think we should also oppose policies that don't contain our language. Okay. 
And then, and that's, uh, uh, you know, I mean, there's room to move there, obviously, but what I'm looking for is encouraging the support of our language, which, which is where we stand on these issues. The next thing would be the new item C, which is, I think, just below there, two paragraphs below. So this new item C, directly following what I have above there, says that we should assert Peninsula Clean Energy's inclusive and sustainable workforce policy wherever no such policy is present. And I only say that because we now live in a world where entities are choosing to leave, to, to go with no policy on issues which clearly call for a policy. They're important issues that, that people need to take a position on. We've taken a position. And so if there is no policy, I say that we should assert our policy as a policy that would serve well to meet the needs in terms of workforce policy. Okay. Uh, are, are there any, so I don't know if anyone from staff wants to comment on those recommendations, um, but comments from staff or from members of the board uh, are certainly welcome. And Don, I assume your hand is up for the issue that you previously brought up. Right, right, right. Sorry. That's okay, no problem. <clears throat> uh, Jeff. Yeah, thanks. I, um, I think that language, what Rick's suggesting is, is actually fine. I would maybe suggest that you could simply um, add it, append the first uh, point onto bullet A. Could, could, bullet A could read support policies that are consistent and oppose policies that are not consistent with a reasonable workforce. I mean, Rick, would that be acceptable? Totally acceptable. Okay. Uh, and um, I, um, I think the second, the second point is fine as well. I guess I'm thinking from a, from a, <clears throat> Thinking about this from a legislative standpoint, I'm trying to think of, you know, if we're talking about this as sort of legislation, um, trying to think of how it would actually apply to anything. I mean, trying to think of a case where we would would ask the legislature to step in. I mean, there's there's lots of places where there is no set policy, but um, I guess I'm I guess I'm asking is this is this a question about sort of you know we're talking about lobbying and and legislation versus just overall policy? Is this is it feels like a very broad statement to include in something that's going to be focused on legislation, but I, that's a question. Well, well, legislation actually does go on around uh, enabling legislation for producing dollars for building generation. So I think it's important that our preference for uh, trained and skilled labor using apprentices uh, and project labor agreements where it's appropriate, it would, would be a good leading uh, bit of language there where in, in certain rooms, there may be an absence of that thought. Okay. Okay, it, Rick, it seems like what you've listed as item C uh, could be included uh, because it, it's really just asserting our sustainable workforce policy where there is none currently present. Yes, exactly. And that could probably be added into A, just as Jeff suggested, adding in the opposed those that. Yeah, that's a good point. Position. Yeah. As long as it's in there somewhere, I'd be very happy. Okay. Uh, okay, and uh, just to clear this out then, Donna, your suggestion is to add a change to what is currently uh, item 7C, is that correct? Right, I'm Mr. just Chair, wondering, wondering if it makes sense to say, um, including but not limited to solar wind, offshore winds, or right. hydro energy. Okay, so including but not limited to right there. Okay, yes, Mark. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, I, I'm looking at the uh, information that Director Bonilla has provided and, and I, uh, Appreciate what uh, Director Alves has said, and I'm I'm not quite sure how this fits into what what we do at the legislative and regulatory levels, and uh, having a hard time um, 
understanding um, what what we would be looking at in terms of legislation and regulatory issues that we aren't already considering. Um, I, I, and, if I may, Mark. Uh, well, I I think it's a, a question for for everyone's consideration. Um, I, I'm. If, if, because the way I, I read the, the section and and uh, and understand the section you're referring to is is that this relates to our local economic development as as opposed to our legislative um, bill review or, or regulatory issues, and so the policy about commitment to a sustainable workforce is under local economic development as as opposed to. Um, one of our, our broader categories. So if, if this is pertaining to development in the PCE and so clean energy area, then I'm not, not then, then I think that would, would work, but I'm not sure how that fits with, with what we're doing at the state uh, level, either regulatory or legislative. Is that I think that what Mark is saying, and Mark, please correct me, I'm just trying to uh, characterize this so that the board can consider it, uh, is there, there easily could be bills that would uh, support some policy at the legislature that would be inconsistent with our commitment to a sustainable workforce. And I, I doubt, Rick, that you're suggesting that we should, that Peninsula Clean Energy should proactively go out and oppose any bill in the legislature that, that is not consistent with our commitment to a sustainable workforce. My guess is that what you're focusing on are issues that come to us directly. And in, in that case, we would oppose those that are not uh, consistent with our sustainable workforce policy uh, and not just be uh, supportive of those that are consistent. Or, you know, on the statewide level, or since we're now involved with CCP, we do have involvement in a much larger geographical area. I think that there's another angle, which is that we could, we could uh, recommend, as you always can, right, um, support if amended right, or oppose unless amended. Those are always categories, right? Uh, I'm looking for the strongest possible reaction to anything that I view as an attack on our values. And where I come from in my life, if you don't stand up for something, you'll fall for anything. And that's why I'm always seeking to cover these kind of gaps where I think we may be vulnerable. Okay, um, I've got a hand up from Mark Roost. So I will take public comment on this. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you, Rick. Um, I agree with Rick Bonilla, and um, you know if got, that goes back a long way. Uh, but so, in terms of what Mark Hirschman is saying, if a legisl if legislation has anything to do with uh, renewable energy and and um, and and anything to do with any energy in any way, shape, or form, then uh, it is a major federal and uh, global objective to have the uh, transition be a equitable and just transition for the people who've been disadvantaged by the structure of society. So we are attacking the existing structure of society and saying, as we transition, we need to make this a bring all boat lift all the boats from the bottom and any time it comes up uh i think rick would probably fighting those who would attempt to cut out the uh disadvantaged communities or the labor the union labor force and uh you know keep doing keep doing the right wing thing so i guess that's probably enough for me to say Are there any other uh, comments or questions from members of the board?
I don't see any comments. I, I'd like to make I'll, a motion, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I'd like to recommend it that, or make a motion we approve as amended per the uh, additions that I've shown. And as discussed, uh, uh, added to item A as seems to be the consensus between the other commenters. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second, James Coleman. Can I can I ask? We, so, yeah. just may I ask that? Um, so I made a comment on part three. You referred to part A, Rick. Are you including yes. or excluding? Oh, actually, uh, I support your thoughts there on uh, your part. So Thank you. I, I think we should also include. Uh, okay. What you suggest, which is, uh, but uh, including but not limited to, yes. Yes. Thank you. Include that in the motion. Thank you. So we will be amending items 7A and 7C. Correct. Okay. Uh, okay. Did you want to make a comment, Tired? Uh, yes, please. Um, I find myself confused, and this is the time for me to comment on it before we take the vote, I think, because I'm overall in favor of uh, what Rick is saying. But I, I think I, I'd like a little bit more insight from um, Mark just because I don't know much about the legislative process, frankly, and how this language guides the efforts we make. I, I don't know what on the ground that that winds up looking like. So if maybe you could describe to me either um, what it would look like to implement this language or what complications it brings to you to implement this language, I'd appreciate trying to find clarification on that. Uh, thank you, Director Big Stick. Um, so in, in reflecting on this, I think the, the policy that we're referring to here is a policy 10 of the uh, Peninsula Clean Energy uh, Policy Manual. And that, that is an internal policy that we follow in the activities that Peninsula Clean Energy is um, involved with in terms of, of what our, our um, approach to uh, workforce issues. Um, expanding that so that we filter legislation through that policy, I think is, is, a, is, is going to be a challenge um, because it requires us to become um, more informed on certain types of on workforce issues. We're not a workforce organization, but become more informed on workforce issues as we filter legislation that we're considering and uh, supporting and opposing. So as it applies to what comes to us and how we view contracts or, or uh, uh, project labor agreements, uh, you know, it, it certainly makes sense for the, the board to have that policy. Um, it's, it's probably, it, it, I'm not exactly sure how it will Im impact our ability to assess legislation, but I expect that if that's an additional filter through which we have to view all, all legislation, uh, it's, it's gonna be um, a, a much expanded portfolio and, and a larger issue to deal with um, because we'd probably be unique in, in that respect and, and don't have that uh, um, in place at this time. And I'm not sure how we, we uh, um, reach that. So as I'm hearing you talk, what I'm reflecting on are the um, challenges of this in staffing that I have in my own city. And I'm normally, um, I would think in terms of, okay, staff, is that something you're able to accomplish? And because I'm not as familiar with PCE staff, frankly, and I don't know the resources uh, as robustly we have at our disposal, I, I'm asking you a similar question in that vein would we be able to um, make the attempt without straining ourselves to breaking? I, I, I'm not able to answer that at this time because I, we, I first saw this um, a short while ago and so haven't really done the analysis as to what it would take. But what, what I do understand or what I think I understand and, and Director Bonilla, please, I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong, is this is essentially taking our internal policy and using it as a filter for things that are going on in Sacramento or in, Sa in San Francisco at the PUC and that um, it, it will inform uh, efforts that we can or can't take 
um, depending upon uh, labor issues as opposed to other other issues, uh, workforce issues as opposed to other issues. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the title, Peninsula Clean Energy Authority 22 Policy Platform. It's not the legislative platform anymore. And, and I'm going down to this item number seven, which includes the legislative action, but it's been somewhat shifted. So the title is Local Economic Development, but it says support policies that are consistent and refers directly to our sustainable workforce policy, right? And under A, right? And under B, it says support policies that enhance opportunities for CCAs, others, to promote local economic development through locally designed programs, meet unique needs, whatever, okay? Under C, support efforts to enhance the development of local and regional sources of renewable energy. So this is construction, right? Including solar, wind, offshore, high, all the things Donna mentioned there. I mean, <clears throat> I think I am speaking directly to the subjects that are outlined in this section. Okay, um, Jan, do you want to comment? Yeah, um, I guess. Yeah, I guess the concern here. Um, and I, th I think maybe I, I feel more concern with the second part of asserting our policy where no such policy is present. Uh, I mean, I think the first the first part where it says support policies and uh, that are consistent and oppose policies that are not consistent with our commitment to a sustainable workforce, that's something that we can probably do. But then to say, to assert our policy where no such policy is present. And, and I think what Mark and I are saying here is that we're an energy company and this is asking us to evaluate uh, all legislation that in terms of its workforce uh, requirements. And, and if there is no workforce requirement to assert our policy in there. And I think it just goes beyond uh, what our capabilities are. Um, as Mark say, stated, we're, we're not a workforce policy company, we're an energy company. And we can certainly look at how, you know, whether how uh, labor is involved in energy projects, but it feels like this might be going beyond our capabilities. And we want to be able to implement what you approve here. And I guess there's some concern on our part that we would not be able to do that uh, properly. So, so I think I would say that we're okay with the first part, but I, I would caution against uh, including the second part. I, I know, Rick, that's maybe coming from the experience at CC Power, but that is not legislative activity. That's a JPA that we're involved in where we were uh, trying to encourage the other CCAs to adopt our policies. But in this case, when we're talking about legislation and having to analyze the workforce portion of legislation, that, go, that goes beyond our capabilities. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks. Uh, I've got two other comments, Rick. Okay. Colleen. Um, I would just support Director Bonilla's uh, change in some of this language. I think if you're you're making a statement of supporting something, opposing it is just as valid. I also think that what he's saying about asserting, maybe the word assert could be changed to encourage. Um, I would assume PCE is approached at time by legislators, and, and this is kind of a mission statement. And if we can't put it in here, I don't know where it's going to appear. So I, I support what he's trying to say. Thank you. Okay, Donna. Uh, thank you, um, Chair Degolia. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering and, and asking staff if, if you know, I don't want to have to add another staff person on to run through the 2000 bills a year that come through the assembly and the Senate in order to figure out which ones are, you know, have a labor content. Cause I'm assuming, so for example, if like something came through on um, another industry, 
or something around the teachers or something else, then we would have to be weighing in and opining on this. Is, is that the concern, Jan? Okay, so, so I think as fiduciaries, our primary responsibility is to Peninsula Clean Energy and it's to our ratepayers. And I don't wanna extend our staff into areas that are beyond the purview but I can appreciate what Rick is saying. So I'm wondering, can we, you know, maybe would a compromise be that we just, you know, focus on the energy sector, at least for a year, see how busy that keeps us, understand, you know, maybe they can just toll, like there would be, have been another 800 bills we would have had to look at and opine on or send letters to or something and, and, and just focus on the energy sector for now um, so anything related to energy, that's still pretty wide, you know, EV charging, energy, um, energy efficiency, reach codes, anything like that. I think that would be within our purview and that would be workable for our staff. Um, what I don't want to have is us miss the important work in the energy sector because we're fooling around over here in, you know, Uber and Lyft and things that we don't have anything to, to, to do with necessarily. So that would be maybe a compromise. Rick and then Giselle. Rick, you're on mute. You're muted, Rick. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I'd like to uh, 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 clarify that I am speaking really only about energy. Uh, and let me just make one point. We have a policy about unbundled recs. So if we see legislation coming down the rail and we have a chance to talk with a legislator about that, wouldn't we want to say that, you know, we actually have a policy, we support this thing, but we do have this policy about unbundled recs, and here are the reasons why, right? And I think the fact that we have our board saying this is our policy adds weight to this and makes a difference that's positive for, for our own sentiments about how renewable energy is actually, whether it's produced or not, because Unbundled recs, we don't know what the heck they are, what's being produced there. That's why we don't include them in any of our packages. Uh, the other thing is, um, like I said, we don't look at every single bill, only energy bills. Okay. And so this pertains directly to our subject matter. And um, I'll leave it at that. I'll let the next commenter go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor or Mr. Chair. Okay, Giselle. This is a fascinating discussion. Really appreciate everyone who's contributed. And I do totally agree with um, Director Mackin on sort of wanting to have a high bar. I see the pragmatism uh, Director Colson is infusing and the passion from um, Director Bonilla. I mean, I wonder if there's just an easier way to operationalize this. We've just scoped it down to specifically energy. And then I wonder if the layer is, if you're gonna support then we would want to look for this measure. You know, in our city, we've put in place, for example, a green purchase policy. And so it's, you know, when we go to make a purchase, we want to look for X, Y, and Z. Um, and then put the onus back on the legislative staff to say the bar for us supporting this would be inclusion of X or, or, or similar. So I, I just, I wonder if we could thread the needle on operationalizing it to make it easier uh, on our staff, but still get the desired outcome. We think at a high level, what we're looking for is the industry is changing and we want to take jobs along on the transition, right? And not eliminate jobs from you know, dirtier energy. We want them to come along to clean energy. And, and so I appreciate the spirit of it. And I'm wondering if that would get us there. Okay, hey, Laura. Um, thank you. I, I see that um, Rick has his hand up again, so I'd, I'd defer to him and, and then I'll make comments after. Go ahead, Rick. Thank you very much. You know, seeing that the, the, the second item that I suggest is stirring a lot of controversy, I'd be happy to actually go with the first item that's, that I suggest, which is opposing policies that are not consistent with our policies and letting uh, uh, our legislative staff, when they work on legislative issues regarding energy with legislators who are making proposals, only carry that with them from our board, which says, yes, we have this policy, we support this policy, we stand for this policy, and we would support this legislation if it met these standards. And if it doesn't, then we can't support it. 
Okay, Laura. Unless it's a minute. Yeah, thank you. I, I think um, I, I'm appreciating what um, Rick is saying now, I, I think, and I agree with some of the comments made. It's kind of like taking what we can operationalize now and maybe the higher bar stuff, maybe that's something that staff could take a look at and come back to us. I think there's been a lot of ideas suggested today, um, but I, I recognize that what PCE is trying to do is be a leader in this space. And so how do we strike that balance uh, without taxing um, staff uh, during these you know, pretty challenging times? So um, thank you. Okay, uh, let, let me add a comment. Um, we have established two strategic priorities for PCE uh, that we, you know, really discussed in detail at our retreat in September. Uh, that are two very big issues. I mean, the, the issue of being clean energy twenty four seven. We are the only LSC in the United States to establish the policy that we've established. Google and Microsoft have taken up that policy to try to achieve it by 2030, and we've established a policy to try to achieve it by 2025. I think that is truly remarkable, and that's an issue that has enormous impact within the energy industry. We haven't tasked our staff to go out and look at any bill that would support or oppose that. And and I don't think we should. Uh, I mean, we're not, we're not a legislative organization. Uh, now, we could choose to invest in that. that. That would be a valid thing for us to choose to do, but we haven't chosen to do that. We've chosen to focus on the business that we have serving our customers. Uh, so I have absolutely no problem with the suggestion for this policy, so long as it with, is within the realm of the business that we currently have. So for businesses that we engage with, I want them to support our sustainable workforce policy. And, uh, and I have absolutely no problem opposing uh, policies that are in opposition to that. But, but I really don't want to engage our staff to go out and look through every energy bill that might come before the legislature and try to evaluate whether it supports the policies that we've established or and, and work to oppose those that don't. That, I don't think that's our job. Uh, and if it is our job, we should, we, we should assert the two critical strategic priorities that, that we put forward as the driving forces uh, for PCE. Uh, now, I, I think, Rick, that staff can take that and work that into the policy so that it applies to those things that where we engage in our business. For example, CCP, this issue came up before CCP and, and the RFPs that CCP issued and our staff uh, you know, they chose to spend time on work on the workforce policy and on the environmental policy that that those CCP uh, RFP efforts targeted. And that that was what we contributed to to the long term storage issue, uh, rather than focusing on, you know, one one of the other uh, strategic priorities that we've established. And I think that was fine. And that was a real contribution that we made uh, to that. Um, so if we can interpret this and let staff work with it to correct the language so that it deals with the business that we have, but uh, if the intent is to try to go out and establish legislative policy that goes beyond our particular business, that's a different issue. You're, you're muted. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, for saying that. If I may clarify, I, I, I'm not saying that our staff should go out and look at all the energy legislation that's coming down the road. Okay, clearly we get involved with certain legislation that that for whatever reason is legislation that fits our needs. It's legislation that would be helpful to us in doing what we do, right? And I just offered to amend amend my suggestion anyway. So my motion. So um, like I say. If we could just uh, add the new section B, 
about opposing policies that are not consistent with our policy, that's, you know, uh, that's good for now. I'll take that increment and we can come back another day. But I am not suggesting that our staff should go out and look to pick fights over this. Uh, okay, so Mark, I think that addressed what you were raising. Uh, and I, there's an interpretation issue here in terms of how we uh, promote and enforce the policies that we choose. And we, we've got all kinds of policies and, and basically they're giving guidance to you and to staff uh, in the context of the business that we're engaged in, not going out to um, try to cut new ground. Well, I think in some places we are. I mean, Jan is, is, is actively asserting the two strategic policies that we've right. established, right. Uh, which I think we've agreed to do. As, As we should do. And, and, and this isn't conflicting with that. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that's right. Great. Okay. Um, I don't see any other comments at this time. And if there's any comment from members of the board or any public comment, now would be a good time to indicate it. Okay, can, and we have a motion uh, to approve this uh, policy as amended with uh, the comments that both Rick and Donna have made. Uh, I mean, great, thank you, Nellie, with, with the highlighted additions. Can we do a roll call on that? San Mateo County? Yes. San Mateo County? Atherton? Yes. Belmont? Yes. Belmont? Yes. Brisbane? Yes. Burlingame? Yes. Colma? Yes. Daly City? Yes. East Palo Alto? Yes. Foster City, Half Moon Bay, yes. Hillsboro, yes. Los Banos, yes. Menlo Park, yes. Millbrae, yes. Pacifica, yes. Portola Valley, yes. Redwood City, yes. San Bruno, yes. San Carlos. San Carlos? Yes. San Mateo? Building Trades Workers of California, thank you, and I say yes. South San Francisco? Yes. And Woodside? Yes. Thank you, the motion passes. Thank you. I don't know if anybody heard me. Uh, the next item on the agenda is an update on the long-term uh, uh, duration storage project. Okay, and I'll, I'll give a short update on this. So as you recall, you all attended a special meeting a week and a half ago to uh, approve um, CC Power participating in the Tumbleweed Long Duration Storage Project and approving Peninsula Clean Energy's participation in that project too. Uh, the next day on January 19th, CC Power had their board meeting and there was a unanimous vote by the CC Power board to participate in the Tumbleweed project. And um, in fact, a press release went out yesterday, I believe. Um, to announce the signing of the energy storage, energy storage services agreement between Tumbleweed and CC Power. Um, so now the other CCAs have 90 days to get their own approval. And uh, most of those CCAs are bringing that to their boards in February. We're all done. Congratulations for uh, being the first. And uh, so we're hopeful that all of the other CCAs will 
um, vote in the affirmative like you did. Great. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Jan on this issue? I don't see any. Is there any public comment on this matter? I don't, I don't see anyone with a hand raised. Uh, okay, we will move on uh, to the next item, which is approval of the e-bikes update. Uh, great, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, everyone. My name is Philip Kobernick. I'll be speaking on this item. Um, I'm on our transfer, or, sorry, on our programs team, um, focusing on our transportation portfolio. Okay, next slide, please. So here's a summary <clears throat> of the request for your board tonight. Uh, this is part of our e-bike rebate program, which is called our e-bikes for everyone program. And the request is for approval um, of a budget increase to the program and an associated amendment with uh, Ride Panda, which is one of our bike shops that we have on contract for this program. And the total amount is $300,000 for additional incentives. <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. So here's an overview of the program. Uh, this was originally approved by your board uh, in July of 2020, and this was intended to be a three-year program. The original budget was $300,000 total, 240,000 of that was in incentives, that was an $800 rebate for about 300 bikes, and then included a $60,000 set aside for bike safety workshops and outreach with the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition. And they just had their first two events, um, one with a nonprofit bike shop in East Palo Alto, and then a online workshop uh, last week, which had over 50 people attend. So very excited about that, um, that partnership. <laughs> The program was only available to low and moderate income um, programs exclusively. It was an income or an equity-based program. And we had bike shop partnerships to help us uh, offer the rebate as a point of sale discount. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So some context on the overall popularity and growth of e-bikes, they're incredibly popular. Um, in 2020, uh, more than two times, or two times more e-bikes were purchased in the United States than electric vehicles. That's a, roughly about half a million e-bike sales in the US in 2020. So really explosive growth, a 240% increase in e-bikes in 2021. And uh, some research is now being done on kind of the stickiness behavior of e-bikes and finding that 15% you know, of overall Americans plan to bike more um, kind of post COVID. And if those folks had some biking experience, that number increases to 40%. Um, so there is sort of some um, potential for long-term behavior changes uh, with e-bikes. And another important note is that the state approved a uh, e-bike rebate program as part of Governor Newsom's budget, and that will be coming at some point at the end of 2022. There's a CARB working group to help inform this uh, rebate, and uh, um, Penn Silicon Energy is, is participating in that effort. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> So I wanted to include a couple of highlights from our uh, customers here. This was a, an incredibly popular program and we got some really great photos from folks uh, that shared their experience and their overall kind of how they're using their bikes right now. Um, and these are, they're always fantastic to, uh, to, to include here. Um, a, couple, a couple of really nice highlights. Okay, next slide please, Ellie. So some of the key metrics here, so we sold 276 e-bikes or provided rather 276 rebates. Uh, there's a customer satisfaction of 93%. Um, nearly all of the rebates, 85%, were done through the bike shop partnerships that I had mentioned, um, of which we had four total. The uh, bikes were used, our, we, we, we surveyed our, our rebate receivers and found that usage for utility-based functions like errands, um, going to work, uh, visiting folks, the things that would normally be replacing a car were pretty high. Over 50% um, were those types of trips. And the other 45% or so were recreation type trips. Uh, the average pre-rebate bike price was about $1,200, uh, $1, about $1,300. And we brought that down to below 500 with the, with the rebate that we were offering. Okay, next slide, please. So a few more uh, data points here. We collected a lot of data points in this program um, that I'm, I'm excited to share here. 
So the average household income was under $40,000 that, uh, that was self-reported from our recipients. So we're really, again, exclu exclusively focusing on our, our customers with low to moderate incomes. And a pretty even age distribution, which you'll see on the right here, uh, there was uh, a lot of interest across all ages. And the gender split did skew male, um, about 68-30. And so that's one of the things that, you know, that we're looking to possibly tweak with some, with some modifications in this next round. Okay, next slide, please. So a couple of um, a couple of points here on the impact um, from from e-bike users, and we took this data to estimate what the greenhouse gas impact is from this program. And uh, to my surprise, car trips were really reduced pretty significantly. Um, based on the folks who got our rebate, uh, they're reporting that their car trips were reduced by about thirty eight percent total after they got uh, a rebate from us. And now for these, for these folks, an e-bike is the primary mode of travel for about one in six people. Their average trip when they're replacing a car is about 11 miles. So they're, they're using them for pretty extensive trips and they're doing that about three times a week. So all that adds up uh, to some pretty serious uh, car trip uh, reduction. And then I, we've calculated that basically about 83 gallons of gas per year looking at regional fuel efficiency averages or about three quarters of a metric ton of greenhouse gas avoidance per year per bike. Um, next slide, please. So another data point that I wanted to add was the regional distribution of our e-bike rebates. Um, we found that they really did track all over the county. Um, you know, one thing that we, I had a question on going into this would, would they maybe be concentrated in more areas versus others and found that really the rebate correlated with, with population more than anything else across the county. A lot of folks on the coast, a lot of folks all over the place uh, tracking pretty, uh, pretty even the population. Okay, next slide, please. Now we did ask folks, um, the, the folks that did not use a rebate, um, so we, they were offered a rebate and then they didn't use it in the 30 days that they were given. Um, we asked them why they didn't, and we actually went back and, and got more responses based on some feedback from the executive committee to increase the response rate on this. And um, I, the, the primary reason, which you'll see here, about 44%, um, was the bikes were still too expensive. Even after taking $800 off the cost of a bike, the, the, the cost is really the main one. And also there's pretty limited availability of bikes in the more affordable range and bike shops. So the second most common response was, you know, there, there weren't the styles that I like, or I, I you know, I, um, folks didn't have enough uh, time or opportunity to like ride one in person, or they didn't have the types that they liked in person. Okay, next slide, please. So some of the challenges going into what would be this next phase of the e-bike rebate program um, is that uh, the sales prices for e-bikes are going up. Um, so unfortunately, they're not going down. Uh, prices are increasing. Um, and this is part of the larger picture of just general inflation pressures and supply chain pressures uh, that uh, retailers are experiencing. So one that we worked with closely was saying their prices are typically about 10 to 20% higher this year than last year. And the other critical challenge is that there really is even more limited availability at bikes that are priced under 1800, uh, which is what we were really focusing on in the previous round. And there are no, there's not a lot of cargo bikes at that price range and none in the participating bike shops in our program, um, which really kind of limits the use cases that folks can use them for because cargo bikes really open up the door for a lot of different types of use cases on an e-bike. And again, supply constraints are really the primary factor uh, that's impacting this. Okay, next slide, please. So here's an overview of the changes that we are proposing to make in this next round of the e-bike rebate program. So the first is to increase the rebate amount from 800 to 1,000. And of course, we would still cap it at 80% of the purchase price, which is what we did last time. And that $1,000 amount is consistent with Sonoma Clean Powers program. Um, so it's a $200 increase there from 800 to 1,000. The second is to increase the cap that we set on the price of the bike. Previously, it was $1,800. And we are, I'm proposing that we increase that to $3,000. 
And there's two reasons for doing this. The first is that it really is necessary to have more in-person bike sales. Again, because the, the inventory of bikes, the lower price point under 1800 is extremely limited these days. And so increasing the price would allow more people the opportunity to try one in a store, a brick and mortar store, and then you know, purchase one there. And the second is I would like to encourage more cargo bike purchases, which are at the higher price point. And that opens the door again to much more wider use cases. Uh, so folks that are taking their kids to school, folks that are in grocery shopping. And my hope there is that a wider use case uh, that we can encourage in this program would lead to a, a wider diversity of folks uh, that are using the rebate. The third is a more minor change. Um, we had unemployment insurance as a eligible proof of income in our last program. And I'm uh, proposing that we remove that because it was a, a pretty difficult one to administer and is less relevant than it was when we launched this a year ago. So in uh, some other um, tweaks that I'm proposing to make here on the purchasing side, the first is that uh, we would limit the, the rebate to only be redeemable at a participating bike shop. Uh, again, 85% of sales were at those bike shops, so I don't anticipate it would be a major change. And of course, we would add new bike shops. We had four in the last program. We'd be looking to add uh, more in this round. The third is that we're going to now support offline op applications. So folks that don't have access to the internet or have a hard time navigating the internet, we want to support those folks in applying for the program. And we're going to be doing that with a drop-in center with El Concilio, one of our outreach partners um, that we just approved. Uh, and then partnerships with operators of affordable housing, giving them the resources that they need to help their residents apply for the program. And the fourth is uh, more on the marketing side, but we're going to promote financing options more. Um, pretty much all of the bike shop uh, that we partner with have some kind of financing options. And I think my putting some more education on that, that might help folks uh, pay for bikes, even if there is a few hundred dollars left over after the rebate splitting that over a few months might make that purchase more manageable. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so on the timing and the funding amount, so this budget request is for 300,000 in additional incentives. And we plan on rolling over 20,000 in unspent funds from the last round. So that would, uh, that would give us about 320 e-bike rebates. Um, and, a, and a quick note, the reason we had leftover funds in that last round, even though it was an incredibly popular program, was because of that, that kind of churn rate that we proved a lot of folks and then uh, some folks dropped off, especially at the end. And so we had already um, put a stop on the incoming because we had so many incoming applications. So there was a little bit of funding left over that we're proposing that we move into this next round of the program. For timing, um, I'm proposing that we do a soft launch uh, and that would be contained mostly through marketing and how we do our partnerships starting in March. And that would be with affordable housing operators uh, first. And the main reason there is we uh, wanted to give residents of affordable housing a chance to have access to the program, but it was sold out so quickly last time that we didn't really end up um, kind of dealing with our uh, working with the, our target audience here uh, that much. So they would, they would be included in a soft launch a little bit early. And then Los Banos, as soon as uh, customers enroll in April, and then a general program promotion in May uh, as part of Bike Month, of which at that point, uh, the rebates will go pretty quickly, we expect. Okay, next slide, please. Now, there is a contract increase associated with this request, and that is with Ride Panda increasing their contract by $225,000. Um, the reason here is uh, that Ride Panda was a really instrumental part of our last round of the program. Uh, they are an online retailer but based here in the Bay Area, and they really specialize on the affordable range of e-bikes, uh, having a really wide inventory of bikes kind of in that price range. And as a result, uh, nearly four in five of rebates in our previous round were with Ride Panda about 218 total. It was an incredibly popular option uh, that our customers chose. And we're anticipating that they would be similarly popular in a next round. And so we would take the 51,000 in our unspent funds in that contract and then add 225,000 more. 
so that they'd be able to handle up to 276 e-bikes or $276,000 for the next round. Okay, next slide, please. And this is my recap. Uh, so again, this is part of our e-bikes for everyone program, uh, which is the name of our e-bike rebate program. And the request is for approval of the incentives budget increase and the associated contract with Ride Panda. And the funding amount is 300,000 for our incentives budget. And happy to take any questions. Great. Are there any questions? Questions or comments from members of the board? Uh, Donna and then Betsy. I'm gonna I'm gonna defer to Julia because I feel like I've said a lot and I'll listen to these guys and then if they don't hit my point, I'll go back. All right. I'll, I'll take Betsy and then Julia. Thank you. I was, um, I love this program. Um, I really like the idea of doing more in-person bike sales and supporting our local stores. Um, so I'm a little, um, I'm wondering if you can explain the increase in Ride Panda. Because yes. that's online. Yes, happy to. And of course, our next round, um, we would be looking to add more sales at our local bike shops. And, and I think the best way we would do that is increasing the price cut off for the actual bikes, um, because unfortunately our in our in person bike stores have really next to no inventory below eighteen hundred dollars. So by increasing the price, we'll be able to encourage more sales to happen in person, and I think possibly a larger share of those bike uh, bike sales to happen in person. Uh, so I think that's one factor that will that will do that because um, I agree that's an an important thing to do. Um, the increase in Ride Panda is uh, basically taking into account what we expect based on our first round. So if 80% of sales again happen um, through Ride Panda in our next round, that's what this budget is based on. But of course, this is about to exceed. So if our in-person bike shops um, are attracting more sales and more customers because of these tweaks and have more bikes available, then that would be able to be accommodated as well. Did that answer you, Betsy? Um, well, I guess, my, thank you. Um, my concern is that we don't have people going to our local shops, trying the bikes, and then moving over to Ride Panda, which, um, so whatever we can do to encourage people purchasing at the local shops when supply is available, we need to do that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Julia. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate staff's, you know, thoughtful changes to this program after the first round. And um, I think, um, you know, I agree with the proposed changes. I do want to highlight number three of the purchasing, um, the slide that you had there, uh, specifically um, about being more inclusive for applicants who are not using the internet to buy these. I think that's a great idea. And I'm always um, impressed how many people actually still don't default to order things online and that's not still where they necessarily go to first. So it's important to remember that. And then uh, we do actually have a few 100% um, affordable housing um, developments coming online and they are actually, the operators at least of one are giving um, points to applicants for units who do not have cars. Um, so I could see something like this being really important to people who still need to get around, but uh, who, who can actually get a better chance of getting into those units if they if they can apply and don't need a car or parking space. So um, yeah, I think these changes are great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Rod. Yes, I think it's, um, oh, my, can y'all hear me? No yes. problem. Yeah. Some... Sorry about that. We can hear both um, of you. <laughs> yeah, that's what they say. Yeah. Well, um, I, I think this is a, a great program. Um, I don't know if it's just where I'm at, but I've I've seen an increase of people um, with e-bikes, and I'm not necessarily sure if it's from this program, but I think it's a, a great way for both physical exercise and also, um, you know, the um, the environment as well. So, um, thank you for putting this together, and I fully support this um, program. Great, thanks. Harvey. Uh, I also think this is a wonderful program. I think it really is a, 
a step in the direction of really uh, reducing greenhouse gases. It's and my question is, can you use more than the 300K that you're requesting? Uh, is considering the fact that the first round was sold out so quickly, e-bikes are becoming very popular. Uh, we seem to be doing better financially for various reasons. I would like to give you more than that. I'd like to probably give you 500K if you could use it. So that's my question slash comment. Uh, you want to respond? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. We'll uh, we'll certainly consider uh, the board's direction on that. Uh, and if you have a request for us to consider and or bring back a proposal for you, um, we'll we'll take that. Great, Giselle. Thank you. Um, well, this is very exciting. Um, thrilled that we are now here, well ahead of schedule on this program. Um, you know, when this was actually something that I'd first brought to commute.org when I was a board member there, and then it made sense here, but um, it's really exciting to see the move to the cargo bikes. Um, that was actually the original inspiration. It was seeing a mom dropping off her kid at school on a cargo bike and that that was taking off, but that they were so inaccessible for so many families. Um, and then seeing other moms having to walk across town with just a stroller and with a, a five-year-old walking. So this is a great solution uh, for, I think it could be a great solution for uh, a number of transportation needs in our community, getting cars off the streets. I completely agree with uh, Director Rohrbach that as we watch this, I, I hope that staff continues to come back um, with more asks uh, and, and we scale it and, and perhaps even share it with other uh, uh, CCAs uh, similar to the ones that we've been following too. So. Very excited to see it take this next step. And thank you so much for your work on this program. Thanks, Giselle. Carlos. Yeah, a couple of questions about how the program works. How is income certified? Is it self-certification? A great question. Um, so we accept a number of different options for folks to do proof of income, and that's designed to help minimize the burden when applying for the program. So folks can submit proof of enrollment in about a dozen different programs uh, as their proof of income. So that could be that they're either already approved as a care fair customer, they receive low or reduced income lunches, um, they have supplemental social security. There's a number of programs that we accepted um, enrollment in. Um, and if they didn't have proof of any of that, um, we would take a file tax return to, to show income. Okay. So it's attestation okay thanks uh the other question is in terms of your tracking actual mileage um you know trips uh how how reliable is your data and i'll tell you i so when i That's primarily a bike around when i when, when i uh, usually bike around i in my head estimate how far i've gone but I went so far as to get one of those programs that are so invasive to track like how far you actually go. And when I compared what was in my head to how far I actually, I was off about 20%, right? At 20%, I thought I was, I was, you know, whatever, biking 20% more longer than I had anticipated. So, or, or at least calculated in my head. So how are we going about determining the length of trips here that you have in your survey? And again, this is all self-reported or is there some other way of getting the data? Uh, thank you, Director Romero. Um, so that allows me to bring up an extra point um, that I had not mentioned earlier, is that the data that we're gathering also, we're, uh, we're collaborating with UC Davis, who is evaluating the effectiveness of various different e-bike e rebate programs uh, across the Bay Area and across the state. And they provided us a survey template that uh, they're using to do these evaluations. So we relied on that. Um, so folks can enter in um, how much they think their trips are, but we also asked specifically if folks had odometers, as some bikes do have odometers, and then uh, asked for them to report the number that's currently on their bike odometer. Uh, so it's a kind of two different sources. There's the people guessing, more or less, and then also an actual hard data point. Okay, great, thanks. And then finally, have you since the program was oversubscribed very, very quickly, 
have you ever thought of doing some sort of trunching of the program where, and, and each trunch maybe had a lottery. So you had, you'd open it up, you know, and you would allow 150 of these rebates and, you know, for the next month people could apply and then you would have a lottery for those, you know, assuming that, you know, people qualified because it just seemed like within a week or two, right, you completely exhausted uh, the rebates. And with that, would, would it make any sense to think about that, that type of, a, of an approach to it's more work on your end? Anyway. <laughs> No, that, that's, uh, that's a great suggestion. Thank you. And uh, we certainly could accommodate more funding is a potential in our, in our program. Um, our request tonight is for 300,000 in additional incentives. Um, but uh, if requested there, you know, there's opportunity and certainly demand, uh, as you as you indicated. Yeah, but I, I think my question was more, you know, if this, if, if the window of opportunity is a week, because mm -hmm there's this, this demand, um, wh why wouldn't we allow, you know, you can take the 300,000, break it up into two tranches. And as I said, allow a number of people to apply and then through a lottery, you would determine who actually got it. But then, because there could be perhaps wider dissemination of the interest and information on this. Right. Well, um, well let, let, I'll leave it that. let me restate what Carlos just said, because I, what, I think what he's saying is, that we prioritize the first program based on time of response. And he's saying, why not set a time period, a week or two weeks, whatever you choose, and take all the responses. And if it's more responses than we have availability, mm -hmm. that will uh, benefit your database. We could go back to those people in the future but we could allocate within that response group by a lottery rather than just by those that are the quickest to respond. And isn't that what you were going for, Carlos? Yeah, you, you've you developed my idea even further. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Oops. Donna. Laura, were you ahead of me? Do you wanna go first? Okay. Right, you're ahead of me. Okay, thank you. Um, so I everything I, I love everything we're doing on this program, and I always I always think about scalability, and I love that we're talking about everybody in this, and I I I really appreciate how we're focusing on the low income communities, but I'm trying to think about ways that we could scale it. If we could get every person, you know, if we could get half the people in San Mateo County or three quarters of the people in San Mateo County to get an e-bike and reduce their VMT by 40%, that now starts to make a difference as opposed to 200, 300, 400 bikes. So my question now becomes, how do we scale it? <clears throat> and I'm wondering if at some point, you know, no, no, everybody likes a deal. So we're, we're really financing people who can't afford them otherwise with these big programs, but there might be a version four or a version five or a version six where we give a $50 rebate and it's open to everybody regardless of income because people sometimes are more incentivized to do something if they have even a tiny rebate, even if they economically don't need it. But, you know, and they may like miss the deadline, but it gets them interested. Or in Burlingame, one of the things we're doing is um, we have a, a heat, um, an induction cooktop and we have like three of them and we're leasing them out at the library to residents to try induction cooking. What if cities were able to have 10 e-bikes, cargo bikes, et cetera, et cetera, that were at their library or somewhere on, on their premises that could be checked out for a week. And you know, you give your license and you give a, you know, you, you somehow substantiate it so people don't walk away with them, but you let them try it. I think if people just tried it, I know I love my e-bike. I didn't, I wasn't great regular biker, but I'm like, I love my e-bike. And so if, if you could get more, you know, middle-aged women like me and say, Hey, you know, get on this e-bike, you're going to love it. I use it, you know, use it to go to work, use it to drop your kids off. I think you could all of a sudden explode it and like really have meaningful impact. So not necessarily for this round, but I hope we'll think about how to scale it, how to get more efficient, and maybe how to do some other interest where we loan out the bikes and let people try them for a week. 
Laura. Great, thank you. Um, really good discussion and lots of great ideas. And um, I, I'm actually, as everyone's talking, kind of blending uh, some of these ideas together. So I really appreciate uh, Donna's perspective on scaling this and identifying other target audiences with which we can get that experience, um, similar to what was done, I think, for the electric vehicle program, right, where there was a, you know, just drive it, you'll like it uh, type program, test drive approach. Um, I'm really appreciative of um, Betsy Nash's comments about trying to see if we can't bring this into local retailers because um, you know buying and shopping local is so critically important and it's imperative um, for our economic recovery. And I'm wondering if the board is so inclined to um, add additional funding to this, perhaps those additional dollars could you know, would the board consider having those additional dollars go towards a local retailer program um, so that we can meet that gap that uh, Philip was talking about earlier. Um, and then finally, um, you know, one thing that I've observed with the um, upcoming updates to our public transportation system is that there are gaps um, in public transit on the coast side. And uh, might we consider uh, targeting some of those communities uh, for which um, you know car transportation is a challenge and uh, uh, bus transportation is um, non-existent. So um, just some additional food for thought. Um, I think there's a lot of ways we could take this program and those are um, a blending of my colleagues' ideas. And thank you, Philip, for bringing this forward and the staff's hard work on this. Great. Thank you. Anders. Thank you, Rick. Um, so in terms of scalability, scalability just kind of uh, co-telling from what Donna was just saying earlier, uh, there are a lot of local businesses, you know, grocery stores and restaurants that are delivering meals and de delivering groceries to a lot of their local customers. This could possibly be a solution for a lot of these businesses who are also struggling at the same time, right? Um, also, there are a lot of, I know of a few uh, local charitable organizations, nonprofit organizations that are delivering meals to our seniors locally here in the peninsula. You know, this would certainly be helpful to them. Uh, if you would just be able to give them a few cargo bites, then they can start delivering meals to our seniors. You know, it reduces carbon footprint, you know, reduces their cost of operations. Uh, and uh, it could also be a great promoter for this program as well. So I think those are, I mean, if we're serious about increasing the budget for this, which I would be supportive of, uh, I think it'll, it'll go a long way for us to start helping our local businesses as well uh, on that program uh, so that you know, we can really build a critical mass and start promoting this. Thank Great. you. Thanks. So um, I have a comment, which is, Philip, when you presented this to the executive committee, one of the facts that was a really moving fact were the number of families that use these e-bikes to take their kids to school and that replace taking their kids to school with a car, which is a relatively easy thing since people generally live relatively close to their schools. And um, to take a kid on an e-bike, which I think has to be a cargo bike, uh, rather than in a car, that is a that's, that's a really material change, just like going to the supermarket with your e-bike rather than in your car. And supermarkets generally are relatively close to where people live. Uh, though, I mean, that makes a big impact, I think. And I was very impressed at the executive committee when you presented those facts. Uh, so I think it's a great program. I think that, uh, Two things. One, I think the suggestion from Carlos about creating uh, a different mechanism for who you choose is more equitable than what we've got right now. And I think you should make that change in this program. And I think you can. I don't think, I mean, it's going to be a little more work to have to do a lottery or something like that. But to open it up for a week just makes all the sense in the world to me rather than whoever gets online first. Uh, secondly, I think that there's some suggestions here, like what Anders suggested is thinking about how we could make some piece of this program available to businesses or to supermarkets or to 
nonprofits or somebody. I, I don't think that's appropriate for this stage, but maybe for the next stage. And, and I think as Harvey suggested, there's a lot of interest and support for this. We could expand the program beyond 300,000. And I think we will have a phase three, four, and five here. And, and we should, and we should look at, I mean, I think with every one of our programs, we really need to measure the impact that we have. And this is one where we've really had an impact. I mean, it was taken up in a very short period of time, everything that we offered last time. So it makes sense to scale this beyond where we've targeted. Um, uh, so those are my two comments. Uh, I l Let me see if there's any public comment on this matter. Is, that, are, is there any public comment on the e-bike program? Okay, I don't, I don't see anyone's hand raised. I don't see any other uh, hand raised from members of the board. Uh, can we get a motion to approve? I make a motion to approve. Second. Rod, Magbo, that's Magbo. Okay, thanks Rod for seconding that. Uh, if we could have a roll call, that would be great. San Mateo County? Yes. San Mateo County? Atherton? Yes. Belmont? Yes. Brisbane? Yes. Burlingame? Yes. Colma? Yes. Daly City? Yes. East Palo Alto? Yes. Foster City? Half Moon Bay? Yes. Hillsborough? Yes. Los Banos? Yes. Menlo Park? Yes. Millbrae? Yes. Pacifica? Yes. Portola Valley? Yes. Redwood City? Yes. San Bruno? Yes. San Carlos? Yes. San Mateo? Yes. South San Francisco? Yes. And Woodside? Woodside? The motion passes. Okay, thank you. Uh, the okay. next item on the agenda is report on outreach grants. And this will be um, given by Kristen Andrew Schwinn, our senior manager of community relations and Vanessa Shin, our community outreach associate. Great, good evening uh, uh, directors. Would like to give you an update on our outreach grant program tonight. Uh, this uh, isn't an action item, it's just a report. We have the next slide, please. As, as you've probably seen in a uh, press release we put out recently, we just re uh, awarded our fourth round of community outreach grants. Uh, so this is a program that has a, a, a deep history at Peninsula Clean Energy, as much as we have any deep history, because we're um, going on five years old here, but we started this in 2018 uh, when after our first uh, uh, year of enrolling customers, we identified a trend of Latino customers disproportionately opting out of our service. So we put out an RFP um, to community-based organizations to help us communicate with customers that we saw that were opting out in higher levels and uh, awarded uh, grants to five community-based organizations to reach customers in multiple languages and opt-out rates stabilized and have remained low, uh, relatively low ever since. It's hard to say that exactly what the cause of that was, but we do think that working with these community-based organizations um, to reach uh, populations who are opting out was useful. We've got a picture there of one of our early grantees in uh, El Concilio de San Mateo County uh, with PT literature at a community event in 2018. Next slide, please. So in our, for our community outreach program today um, has grown considerably. Uh, we've gone from uh, five organizations to 11. Uh, uh, we are now giving grants up to $40,000 uh, per organization to partner with us on outreach and also for us to learn from the community. So it really is a, a two-way dialogue and a wonderful way to, uh, to connect with our, our community members through these trusted organizations 
and increased trust in Peninsula Clean Energy. Um, in 2021, uh, our outreach partners created an estimated 1.77 million impressions or interactions with our content. Um, and so we're uh, very proud of that. We've got a picture there of our training of our outreach grantees um, in 2021. You see some of their faces. Uh, next slide, please. Outcomes of this program are to um, expand our outreach to low-income and underserved communities, uh, communities that we may have a harder time reaching ourselves. Um, so our uh, outreach grantees communicate in at least five languages. Uh, we increase community trust in Pensacola Clean Energy, increase awareness of our programs, um, our agency, of bills, discounts in general, and provide education to customers on clean energy and electrification. And for the rest of this presentation, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, Vanessa Shin, who's been doing a fabulous job in uh, supporting this program this year. I'd also like to give a shout out to uh, Carlos Moreno, um, who uh, previously worked with me, who did a wonderful job in expanding this program. So uh, take it away, Vanessa. Great, thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, thank you again for the opportunity to share today. And I'm excited to dive in more specifically to give you an update on the outreach grants from last year, 2021, as well as looking forward to the grants this year in 2022. So throughout the presentation, the grants that I'll discuss today all serve residents in San Mateo County. We did invite applications from nonprofits in Los Banos for the last round of applications, but unfortunately we didn't receive any uh, proposals. So as a result, uh, we have allocated additional funding to support community sponsorships in Los Banos um, with the hope that we'll get some applications in for our next uh, funding cycle. So on this slide here, you'll see uh, a quick summary of our outreach grants from the past two years. Um, note that the outreach grants start in January of each calendar year and extend until December. So we just wrapped up our 2021 grant cycle back in December, in which we funded 11 grants at a total of $316,000. And then this year, uh, we just started our outreach grant uh, cycle. And as Kristen noticed, recently published a press release announcing them. And we funded uh, 12 grants with a total of $310,000. So roughly staying about the same, um, but. As Kirsten noted, our outreach grant program has really grown since the early days. Next slide, please. So this slide lists all of our outreach grantees from the past two years. Uh, you'll find a similar summary in your agenda packet as well. Uh, but what I'd really like to highlight on this slide is the incredible geographic diversity of our outreach grantees and the communities that they serve. So you see here that many of our grantees serve the entire county. Uh, but we have others that are more rooted and uh, specialized in particular communities, ranging from ones in the northern county to the southern county and also along the coast side. So I'll um, go through all of these grantees in more detail in just a few slides. Next slide, please. Thank you. So to return to that amazing number that Kirsten introduced us to earlier, 1.77 uh, million impressions or interactions. And I'll provide a little bit more detail of how we got that number and what it actually entails. So to really try to capture the diversity of activities, you know, ranging, um, thinking about both the breadth and the depth of the types of engagements that our grantees have partnered with us on, we thought to categorize them into three different types of interactions. So the first is thinking about distributing printed materials such as flyers, for mailers um, at, at different events. So we estimated that to be uh, the amount of people to be reached to be 54,000 through printed uh, distributions. We also have direct interactions and we wanted to be able to quantify and understand how many face-to-face, person-to-person types of interactions were facilitated by our grantees. So this number of which we estimate to be 20,000 includes the number of people who are reached during tabling events, as well as those who participated in workshops or events, whether they be in person or virtual. 
And then the last category you'll know uh, makes up the bulk of our estimated impressions and interactions, and that is uh, digital engagement. So that discusses and describes interactions through social media, as well as web, ad web advertising, uh, radio ads, and the like. So again, when you add all of that up across all of our grantees for last year, uh, we arrived at the 1,774,000 um, impressions or interactions. And what we really mean by that is the number of times a person got a message about Peninsula Clean Energy or um, one of our programs. Next slide. So now I'm really excited to be able to dive a bit more deeply into all of our wonderful grantees. First up, we have Actera, and this is a nonprofit that serves the entire county, um, as well as the Bay Area more generally. And so for the past two years, we've uh, partnered with Actera on two grants around education for building electrification and electric vehicles. And so for building electrification, Actera has done these wonderful workshops in which they've invited speakers and experts to talk about topics like rooftop solar, EV charging, heat pump water heater, as well as induction cooking. And then for the EV workshops, uh, this year in particular, Actera is aiming to really target the content of their workshops, as well as the outreach to lower income residents and those who live in disadvantaged communities to really make electric vehicles uh, more accessible. Next slide. Next, we have Casa Circulo Cultural. And this is a cultural organization that is based and primarily serves Redwood City and North Fair Oaks. And they have a partnership with Peninsula 360 Press, which is a local media organization. And through that partnership, they've done a great job at helping to distribute information through their newsletter, as well as uh, radio and social media. Um, and then they also have a wonderful network of um, parents and families who attend their classes. So sharing information through those networks. And then we've also supported the Youth Media Project, which is one of their programs that works with youth to create videos and um, got some amazing videos featuring uh, real community members uh, in Spanish uh, through this partnership. Next slide. And then now we have the city of South San Francisco and we partnered with this uh, agency last year in 2021 when public agencies like local governments uh, were eligible for the grant. And the city of South San Francisco partnered with us to distribute and design direct mailers and flyers, which they shared with their residents and businesses, as well as uh, email blasts and other digital communications. Next slide. So we have Climate Resilient Communities, and this is an organization based in East Palo Alto, but also serves some of the surrounding communities. And this is one of our key outreach partners for reaching Pacific Islander communities as well. And so uh, Climate Resilient Communities did a great job this year um, and last year in conducting outreach through uh, both in-person and virtual events, such as flyer uh, tabling at events and hosting workshops. And they've also helped expand our capacity to conduct outreach in other languages and supported us with translating some of our outreach materials such as videos, as well as hosting their own workshops in uh, languages such as Tagalog, Tongan, and Samoan. Next slide. Next, we have El Consulio of San Mateo County. And uh, they've done a great job at integrating our messages as well as our energy programs and discounts. Uh, through their normal work in the community. And so what that looks like is that they've helped educate our customers about Peninsula Clean Energy and where we show up on the bill. And they've also helped enroll uh, many clients in different uh, energy and discount programs. And then in addition to those more high touch type of interactions, they've um, helped partner and facilitate interviews with major Spanish radio stations in order to get our messages out to a broader audience as well. Next slide. So next is Nesha Casa, and they are also based in East Palo Alto, though they do work in surrounding communities as well. And they have leveraged their Promotoras network, which is essentially a network of community members to help conduct outreach through tabling, as well as um, distribute flyers at food distrib uh, distribution events and neighborhood canvassing. 
And they also have a program called the Environmental Justice Parent Academy, which we supported through this grant. And they have been able to integrate information about Peninsula Clean Energy, as well as some of our programs in that um, engagement activity. Next slide. And we are excited to welcome a new outreach grantee this year, Rise South City. And this is a new environmental justice organization based in South San Francisco. And for this grant, uh, we'll be partnering with them to conduct outreach uh, through tabling events, as well as um, support enrollment of residents in South San Francisco in our energy programs. And Rise South City uh, already has a number of different partnerships that they will leverage to further get our message out in that community. Next slide. And then next, we have Senior Co-Siders. This is our primary partner for reaching both older adults as well as residents of all ages along the coast side. So they have um, partnered with us to distribute our information through a, um, a multitude of approaches, including newsletter, social media, and ads in local um, publications and uh, radio. And they've also helped uh, expand our capacity to do outreach along the coast side. And they've themselves expanded their ability to um, conduct this outreach in different languages uh, other than English, including Chinese recently. Uh, so that's something we're also really excited about. And they've also uh, developed notices to distribute in home, uh, home delivery meals and other services that can help us reach older adults and those who uh, might not be on the internet as much. Next slide. And then, so we have the Sound of Hope as well. And this is our primary partner for reaching Chinese speaking audiences um, in both Mandarin and Cantonese. So they're a, radio, a local radio uh, media company or nonprofit. And they partnered with us to promote both our messages and our programs through their web and radio advertisements as well as social media campaigns. And they've also developed some really wonderful videos and workshops for us um, in Chinese to feature some of our programs and other key messages. Next slide. And Support Life Foundation is one of our other new grantees for this year. And uh, they serve the entire county, uh, but do have a focus more on the Northern County. And so they'll be leveraging their extensive volunteer network to be able to help conduct outreach um, at different food distribution events, uh, tabling and other uh, service opportunities in the community. Next slide. And then uh, almost at the end of our list, we have so many wonderful partners. Uh, we have Sustainable San Mateo County. And this is one of our partners that has helped provide more general education around uh, clean energy, uh, electrification and transportation. And so they've done that uh, to their network through promoting our programs through their newsletter, as well as launched um, targeted social media campaigns on our behalf. And they have also developed um, happy hour events, which typically feature a speaker from Peninsula Clean Energy and put them in dialogue with um, other experts in the community. And they'll also be partnering with us this year to host a photo contest and be able to engage people around green infrastructure and building electrification. Next slide. And finally, we have Thrive Alliance. And this is our outreach partner that really helps us um, connect with other nonprofits in the county. So they do that through uh, distributing information through their newsletter, social media, and other um, uh, platforms. And we also, through this grant, support their monthly meetings in which they convene environmental nonprofit leaders as well as other community stakeholders. And they will also this year be planning a major environmental justice summit. So all things that uh, we're looking forward to this year. Next slide. And that concludes our presentation today. Again, thank you so much for the opportunity to provide this uh, update. It's um, one of my favorite parts of my job and I feel so grateful that we're able to share a bit about it uh, with you all today. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Vanessa. And thank you, Kirsten. Really excellent presentation. It's, uh, you know, being on the board, we don't know how broad 
the reach is from PCE. We, we, we know within our own communities because we hear from our community members, but this really gives a great perspective. It's really valuable, thank you. Uh, are there any comments from anybody on the board or anyone in the public? Uh, one thing I would say, Vanessa and Kirsten, each of you, I, I would think about uh, the organizations that you work with and, and that you've presented and think about whether uh, any of those organizations or individuals that you've gotten to know in the course of the outreach would be uh, really valuable members to the CAC. And because we're, we're in the process of uh, having created a nominating committee for the, um, for the advisory committee. And I think that it would, that if there are anyone that you know from these organizations that would be helpful to be more, uh, you know, engaged with PCE at a volunteer level, that, that might be really interesting. You should give that information to uh, a member of the CAC nominating committee. Uh, Rick Bonilla has a comment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I just want to express my sincere gratitude for all of this, this great work that's being done uh, on behalf of PCE. I think that uh, outreach is not especially easy work. Uh, I think a lot of it um, is just really one-on-one -on -one and, and you know knuckling through and working to build this coalition that is actually doing some great work. And I really have to express my sincere gratitude uh, to uh, you, uh, Kirsten and Vanessa and everybody else who's doing this work. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so the last item on the agenda are board member reports. Does anyone on the board have a report? I don't see anyone with a hand raised. Uh, we can have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. We will see you next month. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.